You want to write a delay, but no idea where to start? I decided to make this video in an attempt to get you there as easily as possible, as quickly as possible and even in a scalable way. I want to achieve this by showing different ways to implement delays in C++, starting with the ones that are most simple and progressing to the harder but also more versatile or complex ones in small steps. This video will take place in a C++ project based on the JUICE framework, but the actual delays will be written from scratch, so you can apply the concepts to every programming environment. Let's begin. I already added a new header file to our project that I called delay.h. It contains a DSP namespace in which we will write all of our DSP related classes and methods. One of them is a struct or class called delay. It has a constructor, a prepare method, and a process block method. The prepare method asks for the current sample rate and the maximum block size. While the process block call expects a 2D float array as well as the current number of channels and samples as input arguments. In our audio processor we have to import this header file and create an instance of our delay. We call its prepare method in prepare to play and its process block method in the audio processor's process block method. Now, whatever the delay is going to do will have an effect on the output sound of this VST plugin. When you instantiate an effect plugin on a track in a DAW, it starts working immediately. That means the DAW passes an audio buffer to it that you can modify. However, it is easier to think of the audio stream in terms of individual audio samples or frames. Say your ASIO settings are currently set to a buffer size of 256 audio frames. That means for each channel there are 256 samples. In a stereo context, that's 512 samples in total because 256 times 2 is 512. Each of these samples is represented by a single number. Together they describe how your speaker should move to form sound. We want to define what happens for each channel of the buffer. So we loop over them like this. Inside of the channel loop, we now loop over the samples like that. Now inside of the sample loop, we can actually define what should happen for this particular channel's index and sample index's sample. Or in other words, what happens right at that time for that channel. By the way, this highlights the ultimate building blocks of DSP, which are addition, multiplication and delaying or buffering. You can add a value to the signal to add DC offset. You can multiply the signal to change its volume. And you can store the signal in another buffer for instance, in order to delay it. And that's kind of funny, because if you think of all the wildly different audio effects that exist out there, it's almost unbelievable that they all consist of these basic operations, but they really do. Now getting back to the delay. We have to store the incoming signal into an intermediate buffer in order to delay it. That's because in order to play a delayed version of the signal, the program must remember part of the signal, so to say, let's include array. so that we can have a member variable to store an intermediate audio frame. This delay is only two samples big, one sample for each channel in case of a stereo setup, so left and right or mid and side. We will ignore surround setups.
Now in process block, we can read from our delay buffer and mix its current value into the current sample. Then replace it with a new sample so that it can feed back into the next sample index sample. Let's run this plugin and listen to it in action. As you can hear, when I'm flipping bypass on and off, the sound is not quite what you would expect from a delay. You don't hear it audibly delaying the signal. It sounds more like some sort of low pass filter. The reason for that is because this delay is really short. Delays shorter than 1 milliseconds are common in filter design. A delay has to exceed at least 13 milliseconds in order to be perceivable as a delay. For a sample rate of 44.1 kHz, 44,100 times 13 divided by 1000 equals around 573. So basically, what we have to do now is to store way more delayed samples. But technically, this was already our first successful feedback delay. So let's extend the functionality of our delay buffer to not just store a single audio frame but a whole array of audio frames. We will use std vector for that instead of array because we need the array to be dynamic in order to react differently to the different sample rates. In prepare we can now add an input argument for defining the length of the delay in milliseconds. and resize those vectors to that length, like this. Let's add an inline function to our DSP namespace called milliseconds to samples to outsource this conversion to a more general place and create more readable code as well. This is especially useful because it lets you intuitively define the delay's length with the same unit that is probably given to the user later as well. Remember to update your prepare to play call now and plug in some number to define the delay's length. In our processing method we can now rewrite the logic for accessing this buffer. There are two ways to go about this. One of them is terrible and slow but very readable and the other one is smart and cool and also readable but only once you get the hang of it. Let's start with the terrible one. For this approach we want the first index of the delay to always be the most present sample and the last index to always be the most delayed one. That's intuitive because then you can literally index the delay directly to get the desired delay time. However, in order to use the buffer like that, you have to copy all those values forward for each sample. This is often done for really short delays, like ones that have less than 10 samples. Google IIR filter to find out more if you insist, but prepare to be scared. But it's computationally garbage for most delays. 
what we actually want to have is a ring buffer or circular buffer architecture. The idea of a ring buffer is, instead of copying values around all the time, we just keep them where they are, but redefine which index represents the most present frame for each sample index. Let's rename our delay buffer to ring buffer, but step back from it for a while to only think of this so-called write at. We have to make a new member called right head buffer, a vector of ints. And right head index, just a single int. Now in prepare to play, we let this vector of ints have the maximum block size. This is the biggest block the dog can send for processing at a time. You are using this value whenever you want to fill a buffer with certain other values that can be read later on a sample basis. This way of organizing your audio code is called block processing. We make sure that the right head index starts at zero. Now in process block, we can simply loop over the number of samples and prepare our right head buffer. For each audio frame, we increment its index by one and also make sure that it never exceeds the delay's buffer's length by applying the modulo operator. And we store the resulting value in our right head buffer. Note that the right head doesn't need to be stereo. We can use the same right head values for both channels or even more if we have more channels, which is the major reason why we block processed it before actually starting to delay the audio signal. Now we can revisit the part of process block that processes the delay. Let's get rid of everything. For each sample, we can now read from our right head buffer in order to find out which index currently represents the most present sample and store the current sample from the audio buffer in our ring buffer at that point. This also makes sure to always overwrite the oldest sample from the ring buffer. Because if you think of it, it will take the right head exactly the size of the delay's time for a full loop. Let's define a so-called read head as the index value that comes after the right head. So we can read from the ring buffer onto the audio buffer to add the oldest available sample to it. Be careful here and make sure to modulo the read head by the ring buffer size just like you did with the right head or it can accidentally exceed the length when the right head index is exactly at delay size minus one. Now let's listen to the sound again. As you can hear, this sounds good. The next step is to make it modulatable. So let's add a parameter for the delay's length. I skipped over the part where I instantiated the parameters and everything because that's not what this video is focused about. If you want to learn more about parameter creation in the Juice framework, please check out some of the latest Juice 6 tutorials on the Audio Programmer's YouTube channel. All you need to know now is that I added a method called update parameters, which currently just gets the desired delay length parameter. And I'm calling this method for each block before entering the delays processing method 
in order to update the delay length value. Again, there are two ways to approach this problem now and one of them makes a lot of sense but is bad and one of them makes also a lot of sense but only if you think of it and it's good. Let's start with a bad one. In our update parameters method we can now find out if the current delay's length is a different value than the current desired delay length. If not, we resize all the delay buffers. Easy peasy dawn, let's listen to this. As you can hear, it sort of worked until it crashed at least, but parameter changes introduce terrible audio dropouts. That's because when you resize a dynamic array like a vector in C++, memory allocations on the heap occur. This can be time consuming, not only because it involves a lot of copying, but because your actual operating system decides when it's time to update such allocations. And your application has to wait until that point, even if the audio stream keeps on flowing. You don't want that to happen in your plugin, so you can resize the arrays with your parameter. Let's get rid of that code again and rather ask ourselves how we could change the delay's length without actually changing the delay's length. You know that the right hat always represents the present sample and that the sample furthest away from the right hat index represents the oldest sample. So every value in between should be able to represent all intermediate delay times, right? Let's go into our delay loop, but now, instead of using a fixed read head for reading from the ring buffer, we calculate one. In order to do that, we just have to subtract the delay length parameters sample value from the right head and use this value to read from our ring buffer. Make sure to wrap this value around your delay size so that it can't get below zero. Let's listen to the resulting sound. Success! Changes in delay length don't produce audio dropouts anymore and also don't crash the whole plugin. But apparently we are not done yet. The changes sound all grainy. Why? Before going into that though, let's actually make a separate class for the right head stuff so that we have a bit of a cleaner look in our delay class. I like to arrange it like this.
Now getting back to the grains, you see if you apply a parameter change, the read head moves to the new values instantly. Since you get one parameter value per block, if you try to output parameter values as signals into the audio buffer and run an oscilloscope edit to see what's going on, you would see that it looks all steppy or discontinuous. On top of that, even just quickly moving the parameter itself can be so quick and rough that the actual sound is not that cool. In order to make a continuous motion from your delay rate changes, we have to smoothen the parameter. So let's write a parameter smoothing class. I will mostly skip over the details of this as it's not the core content of this video. But you can basically see it's wiggling a bunch of values around in its process sample call in order to output a smooth version of it. This is basically a low pass filter acting on parameter value signals instead of audio signals. As implied before, I don't want you to think of parameter values as single numbers anymore, but more in terms of full buffers as signals. Let's add another vector of floats to our delay class and let it have the maximum block size. We also need an instance of our smoothing class. Now, whenever we enter a process block call, we can smoothen the input parameter into the buffer. And in our actual delay process, we can now replace the part where we use the actual parameter value with our low pass parameter signal at the sample index. Let's listen to the sound. That sounds really nice. I want to make a quick note at this point to show you how this concept can scale to other types of DSP processes. For example, you could slightly rewrite your delaying code to feed back all the samples into the ring buffer and essentially create a feedback delay like that. If that feedback delay is short enough, it could be used as a comp filter. Or instead of modulating the delay time with a parameter, you could use an oscillator to keep it from ever stopping and that would essentially yield a vibrato. A vibrato with feedback can be a flanger. Or you could let it continuously play back its full buffer at different speeds and create a granular pitch shifter. Or you could replace the delay processing code with one of an all pass filter to create a diffuser. There are nearly endless worlds opening up at this point, as you can see. Anyway, let's play around with some more. What? Why does the delay suddenly sound bad? I did not change the code. It seems like it has something to do with the material that is used. 
The reason for that is interpolation. At the moment, while traversing through the buffer, we round every read head index to the next lowest integer value. Logically, that makes a lot of sense, because there is no 1.5th index of a buffer or something, but you are essentially resampling the audio here, changing its speed. And if you are not resampling some signal speed in purely integer multiples, also called octaves, it will constantly grind on those float point values, unless you can estimate for what the sample would be if there was a sample at that pseudo index. Welcome to the beautiful world of interpolation. Going back to our delays processing code, we remove the part of the code that currently reads from the ring buffer and replace it with a method call that we haven't written yet. It will appear in the interpolation namespace and be called lerp, which is short for linear interpolation. Linear interpolation means that you are basically drawing a straight line between two points to determine the values in between. This creates quite an edgy curve, but it's still way less edgy than next neighbor interpolation or rounding to integers. It works by taking the read head's float index value and rounding it to int in order to get its floor. That way, you can also get the ceiling. Make sure to wrap it around the ring buffer size. Then we can get the fraction of the read head in order to find out if we are closer to the floor or to the ceiling and use that information to add weight to both samples while reading from our buffer. The resulting sample is used then. Now let's run this code. That sounds lovely. I can spoil you already that this is not the holy grail of interpolation though, but just a solid and often reasonable solution. If you ever need to have even more fidelity in your delay, check out cubic spline interpolation or oversample your entire signal. But since that would be way too complicated now, let's just skip that, okay? This is my plugin Nell. A vibrato and an example for an open source delay implementation in a final product that I wrote entirely by myself. In this plugin you can actually go into the menu and try different buffer sizes. For the internal delay to make its depth parameter behave wildly different. From subtle tape wow and flutter over creative resampling to serial scratching. This plugin is available for free and can be downloaded as a VST3 file for Windows directly. It can also be built for Mac and Linux computers if you're into that. This project is kinda crazy. On the one hand, it could be seen as just another glorified feed-forward delay with tons of side features. But on the other hand, it shows how really simple DSP algorithms can build the core of a fully fledged and feature-rich VST plugin that enhances the workflow and hopefully sparks creative ideas 
just by highlighting certain features of the given DSP architecture to add a new perspective to them. In the case of NEL, this is done by attaching an extensive modulation system to the vibrato engine rather than sticking to simple sine wave LFOs. I want you to go out there now and write a delay and think of this. No matter how simple your implementation might be, you can use it for something really cool.